So you're probably excited to, to dive in to your study of the New Testament. You've, you've worked your way through, what was it, 1184 pages of the Old Testament, and now you turn that page over and there it is, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, and you've got this new resolve, I'm going to study the New Testament. And you jump in and in the first 16 verses, Matthew begins with a long list of so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. It's a long genealogy list, and many of you are probably thinking, oh, this is so boring, but this isn't boring. If you consider who's writing, what his audience is, and what his purpose is in, in writing his gospel, Matthew, as one of the disciples of Christ, one of his twelve apostles, he is paying very close attention to this level of detail to try to convince these Jewish people that he's writing to, as well as probably some, some Gentile converts in the mix down the road, that Jesus is the Christ. So how's he going to do that? It's by connecting the Savior with all of the people and all of the promises from the Old Testament that, that run very deep in their Jewish culture. If you look carefully, there's a couple of interesting things going on right here, even in the very first verse. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. So in the Greek, the word generation is Genesis. So Matthew is very purposely trying to echo the idea that this is a new Genesis, a new creation, that God is once again working his love and his order in the world. Then notice these key characters that Matthew connects Jesus Christ to, that Jesus Christ is the son of David, the great beloved king of united Israel, the son of Abraham, who is the progenitor of all the faithful, Abraham the one who received this great eternal promise for God, from God that God would give posterity and prosperity to. So very fascinating that Matthew takes the time to say these are the t two of the most important characters from the ancient Israelite history, and look at how Jesus is connected to them. So that's just the opening verse. And, and we would add one more, even though it's not in the opening verse, we would add one more character from the Old Testament that Matthew is going to be uh, kind of painting this picture over and over again, how Jesus Christ is a new Moses, the lawgiver, the, the one who is the, the famous prophet from the Old Testament. So you get the, the famous patriarch, father of all the faithful, the most famous king, and the most famous lawgiver, all encapsulated in one in a renewed fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy embodied in Jesus Christ. So he opens up his gospel with these connections here, and you'll notice he uses a very interesting technique. So he begins with Abraham, and he goes down through 14 generations between Abraham down to David. So, in fact, let me do it this way. So we're going to start with Abraham here, then you get 14 generations before you get to King David. So Abraham being a direct uh, ancestor for their favorite king of all, and then you're going to get 14 generations down to the exile in Babylon when the, the uh, kingdom was lost to the Babylonians, and then they come back from exile, and you're going to get 14 more generations before you enter on the stage of history, Jesus the Christ. And you'll notice he, he begins with the given name and the main title, the Christ, the Anointed One, the, the Messiah. So it's, it's all here on this, on this first chapter, but did you notice something fascinating? I was going to ask about this. What's significant about 14 three different times? So it, this, is, this is an ancient literary technique. Um, actually, it's not a literary technique. It's just an ancient practice called gematria where they, you would take your name in Hebrew and each letter of your name would have a number value attached to it. 
And if you take all the letters of your name and take their number values and add them together, everybody's name would have a number value. Well, the number 14, if we were to, if we were to get into a time machine and go back to the first century, to Jerusalem or Galilee, and walk up to somebody and say, hey, I've got a question for you. I'm new here, and I hear people talking about 14. Who is number 14? I think most of them would look at you and think, this is obvious. This is our favorite king of all time. What happens is you take these letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and you have Dalit, and then you have Vav, and then you have Dalit. Well, and you're reading from right to left. Dalit happens to be the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Vav happens to be the sixth letter of the alphabet. So if you add six plus four, that's ten plus four equals fourteen. Dalit is the equivalent of our D, Vav is our V, and D, it's David. It's King David. The number 14 is David. So what Matthew just did is he took this genealogy chart and he forced it into 14 generations multiplied by three, but he's clearly skipping people. He's because we're covering 750 years from here to here, you're not going to cover 750 years with only 14 uh, father-son pairs. And in the second one, you're covering 400 years, and in the third one, you're covering 600 years. And by the way, one of the copyists clearly missed one of the names because you've only got 13 there. But you'll notice when he says uh, in verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So Matthew's very – he didn't just do it and then leave you open to figure it out. He says, I did it, now look what I did. His message is a superlative statement that Jesus Christ is the son of David, the son of David, the son of David. Why would he be making such a big deal that the Messiah, the Christ, needed to be a son of David? There seems to be some sense that the number three meant covenantal in the ancient Jewish thinking, and so not only is Jesus a Messiah figure, let's pause there for a moment, you might remember in the ancient world, the ancient Israelites, kings were anointed, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed. So Jesus is this anointed kingly character, David, but triplicate, three times. He is the covenantal king, the promised king. And that is significant. So his Jewish readers, the readers of Matthew, and primarily actually would have been listeners originally, yeah. would have absolutely known like, oh, as an opening thesis statement, it is unmistakable what you're trying to communicate to us, Matthew, that you're going to tell us a whole story. And the entire focus is about who the real anointed king of Israel is. And remember, anciently, they believe it was the king's duty to save the people and to establish peace and prosperity. 